reintroduce Meredith again, so it's on the recording, please. Yeah. I made that mistake last time. Yeah, so uh, welcome to KMLF. Um, today we will hear from Meredith Lewis, uh, who is an excellent facilitator, have uh, experience in knowledge management and in writing. Um, we're hearing from her today to talk about um, and have a conversation about women in knowledge management and the role that they've had, and especially triggered from Meredith's experience in the last year under COVID-19 in Melbourne, where there has been some bias against women knowledge management in the field um, that are at the first hand experience. So um, we are gonna have a conversation about this today and see what we can do as a group and have a discussion about that. So I'll leave it in cable hand of Meredith. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, I'm tuning in here from Melbourne. And I'd like to acknowledge that this is the, the country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my um, respects to their elders past and emerging. Um, so I'd also like to thank the KMLF organizing committee for um, scheduling this session and um, asking me to come on board. Uh, it's, it's an honor as always. Um, this uh, session was inspired actually by some tweets that Arthur and I saw on Twitter at, at around about the same time. Um, and uh, as those are the tweets. I took a photo shot and, and wrapped them up there for you to see. And especially that bottom tweet where Sal in isolation says there's a battalion, a battalion of women out here with incredible knowledge and experience to offer that we're just bouncing along on the bones of our bums while our skills fade and our confidence crumbles. So much wisdom just flushed away. Um, and Arthur responded and said, well, we, we should have a discussion about this. Why don't we have a discussion about this at KMLF? Um, for myself, I'm, I'm really pleased to be doing this here tonight. Um, I spent last year in lockdown communicating with people via Twitter. I was well aware that friends of mine in the um, university sector, friends and ex-colleagues were losing their jobs at a rapid clip or um, losing jobs, full-time jobs to move into part-time or casual jobs. Um, I was a pair of uh, creatives as well, which is another sector I've worked in, um, writers, uh, people who, uh, and knowledge workers in that sector also losing income and, and going backwards. So it's a, a, a kind of a fascinating but rather um, sobering issue, this issue of how women's talents can be wasted or underutilized or can slide out of view. Tonight will be, I won't go there yet. Um, tonight is going to be highly interactive because I don't see the point in coming on board and just looking at you for an hour. As I said earlier, um, I could bury people in all kinds of vastly depressing statistics. Um, and why? Why not use the, the hive mind of KMLF to have a really good discussion? So I'm going to talk for a few minutes and uh, just um, impart a few ghastly statistics and, and quotes. Um, but just to give some ground and a little bit of a context. And then the way the evening is going to run is that I've come prepared with a, a series of provocations um, up my sleeve and I'll fling out a uh, provocation. We'll uh, get you to break into breakout rooms, um, have a chat about that, come back as a group, have a talk about what we've arrived at. And then depending where the group wants to go, I hopefully have a provocation up my sleeve to let the conversation go in that direction. So hopefully this will be a, a useful discussion. Um, I'll talk a in a little bit more detail about how the evening's gonna run, but just first into those context setting um, statistics and quotes. Um, during, I, I mean, I, I think we're all aware that going into last year, um, women were behind, tended to be behind men in a whole series of measurements in terms of 
gaps in terms of pay, amount of superannuation, um, ownership of assets, women in leadership roles, uh, women involved in decision making, women involved in um, policy or narrative building. Um, last year, uh, during 2020, to speak very generally, things seemed to get worse. So here's a quote from a report from the Grattan Institute. Oh, I, I should say that um, I've uh, created a, a collection of articles and tweets in a thing called Wakelet, which is very easy to, for you to go and have a look at. So anything I refer to here will be in that article, uh, sorry, that, that Wakelet collection. It's functioning as an archive of this session, as um, useful background information, and as, um, uh, uh, sorry, I keep on losing the screen. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, you can, good. Sorry, I just lost my screen and I'm not sure okay. why. Um, so the Wakelet collection uh, will, will function as an archive for this um, session and a, a bibliography. That's what I meant to say before I was distracted. So there's this quote from the Grattan Institute. Uh, the COVID recession hit women much harder than men and will compound women's lifetime economic disadvantage. Australian women cop uh, copped a triple whammy they lost more jobs than men, almost 8% at the peak of the crisis. They shouldered more of the increase in unpaid work, taking on an extra hour each day. Um, whoops. Sorry, my um, PowerPoint's just gone bonkers. I don't know why. We got it. We have one hour now. Come on. Okay, have, are you still with me? Because my yeah, we're seeing the doing twenty twenty. Okay, well, I've just lost my screen share and my PowerPoint. I'm really sorry. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, I think yes. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, so let. Can you take my word for it that the statistics were vastly? Um, all the gaps that existed prior to 2020 got bigger, they got wider. Um, off the top of my head, and I think, Margaret, you and I um, exchanged information about this on Twitter, I remember, uh, that, for example, women academics are submitting less for publication. The reason being is that they're at home during lockdown, they got buried underneath extra housework, extra childcare, other responsibilities, they wrote less. Now that's very bad for those women because often career progression relies on them getting published. So that's just one example of some of the things that happened. Um, I saw uh, an exchange on Twitter uh, between two women writers, non-fiction writers, journalists, and they were saying that they were found that they have found recently that when they pitch stories as women, they're invited to write about women's topics, so childcare, well-being, um, relationships, travel, but they cannot seem to sell stories about uh, topical or newsworthy issues. They pointed out that the problem there is that women aren't shaping narrative and aren't feeding into the narratives that people are reading around these issues. Um, what I was wanting to do before we move on is just a quick Zoom chat. Do you all know what that is? Um, sorry, a Zoom chat cascade. Uh, that's where I give you a topic and you have to wait for me to say go. And when I say go, you go into Zoom chat and everybody writes down what's at the top of their head. So just stream of consciousness stuff. Don't worry if you write the same stuff as other people, that's okay. And don't write, worry if you write radically different stuff, that's okay. What I want us to do is think about pre-2020, think about the, the measures or the tactics that you might have seen deployed to help um, shorten the, the gender equality gap between men and women. For example, our own Prime Minister over the last couple of days has introduced the topic of quotas. So that might be one thing that you could write into that, um, into that Zoom cascade. 
So quotas and what other tactics? Is that clear as mud? Yeah. All right. Can you just, can you just repeat tactics to achieve to, to what? Uh, just just any tactic that you saw used uh, maybe in your organization or in your community to um, uh, boost equality between men and women. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. Um, please do ask um, if there's any confusion. So ready, steady, go. And you can write what Arthur just wrote. I did not see anything. Um, if you didn't, 50-50 uh, parental leave, Emily's list, good one. Outcomes versus opportunity, affirmative action, encouraging women to apply for vacancies, secondment opportunities for women, carers leave, mentoring, Yep, and I, I would argue that they are sort of quite typical, flexible working, quite typical of the tactics I was aware of. Here's the thing, um, and behind those tactics, I think a lot of, there was a lot of hard work to get them set up and to have them implemented. Um, here's the thing that in, not in all workplaces, but in some workplaces, they sort of didn't work because too many women went backwards. So my question, my starting point for tonight's session was why didn't the, all of these tactics work better? Why didn't all those years of advocacy that I think we've all witnessed, why didn't that have more of an effect? Um, I, another beautiful quote I had on that PowerPoint presentation that doesn't work was from the, um, I think it was the UN General Secretary and he said during 2020, we saw uh, the fragile um, opportunities and progress, that's right, fragile progress that had been made. He said it could be lost for a generation, which is quite sobering. And that set me thinking, why? Why this gap between all this frantic work around implementing these tactics and yet they don't seem to be working? Um, so what I propose to do tonight, we have an hour, now less than an hour, 45 minutes. I want to, I want us to focus on the context that drives that gap between efficacy in tactics and the actual suggested tactics. I, I want us to get a sense of context. So if by the end of discussion, if people want to talk about what can I do, what could KMLF do, what could I do in my workplace, you will walk out of this discussion with some understanding of, of context um, and hopefully come up with a more appropriate topic. Um, so that's basically what we're going to do. I'm going to stop talking so much soon and hand it over to you. Um, I, I will just wait, make one note, and I was in two minds as to whether I was going to touch on this tonight, but I think I must because it's still in the news. But I, I just want to touch on the situation uh, in Canberra, uh, which is eating up a lot of attention and a lot of the news cycle, and I know has caused a, a huge amount of distress for many, many people. Um, I am not going to make that my primary focus tonight at all. But I do acknowledge how important that issue, all those issues are. Um, Parliament House is still a workplace and it has a workplace culture. Uh, so I invite us, if anybody tonight in their discussions wants to refer to um, what is ha happening in Canberra, go right ahead, but please map it against um, thinking around the culture in that particular workplace culture. Uh, I don't want us to veer off into discussions about the legal nuances or the rights and wrongs of what's going on there. Um, and it's, a, it's an issue to do, I think, with psychological safety. As a facilitator in the next 45 minutes, I do not have the conditions available to me to uh, guarantee the kind of psychological safety we would need to unpack something that is deeply distressing for some people at least. 
Okay, I just thought I had to mention that. Um, okay, so our first provocation, I'm just going to quickly set that up. And I came across a beautiful article talking about people in the labour market. It was not talking to women in particular, but it had a really wonderful central analogy. And the analogy was uh, jungles versus zoos. And the author of that um, article asked, if you have been trained to work in a zoo, how do you thrive in a jungle? And her point was that if you uh, have been trained to work in a, an institution which runs like a zoo, it's nice and regular, there are rules, there are demarcated areas for where creatures live and play. Um, there are regimes in place. If you are used to that setting and then you suddenly find yourself catapulted into a jungle, are you able to function? So, Simon, we're going to need to pop people into breakout rooms again soon. So I'd like you to think about women making their way through their careers, whether it's as a sole trader like myself or within an institution. Ask yourself, and ladies, please share your opinions as to whether women function in a zoo or in a jungle. Think about a woman and a man maybe working in the same institution. Is one of them working in a zoo and the other one working right beside them, functioning in a jungle? Um, you, it's a provocation. So if you think it's naff, slap it down in your breakout rooms and then come back and tell me why. Um, otherwise, I'll be looking forward to hearing what you come up with. Uh, and, just uh, a, how long time do you want in the breakout room? I was just going to say, let's have five minutes. And I'll see you all back here in five minutes. Great sign. Right. Let's see. I uh, should be good. If I can get this to work. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Pam. How are you? 
you're on mute. Right. Sorry, yes. Um, How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, I just caught, caught up on another conversation. I couldn't get. Now I've got a message. Simon's inviting me to join room three. They're in a breakout, are they? Okay. Yes. So you're welcome to join them if you like. Okay. Th Thanks for coming. Hello. Hey, there we go. Sorry, Hi. you weren't alone. Um, I forgot to hack to like leave no, breakout room anyway. So um that's fine. And and I'm glad I was hanging out here because um Pam joined us so I could let her in, which is great. Yeah. I assigned yeah. her as well. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, which is great. All All right. Right. I think we need longer breakout sessions, or I need to talk less. <laughs> <laughs> Probably option two. My we, a bit of we probably we probably do need longer. I've been haunted while during the last few weeks while I've been thinking about this session. I've been haunted by what I would not get time to talk about or talk to. There's so many layers to this that we could unpick, um, and so much we're going to have to leave alone. But where did you get up to in those breakout rooms? And Simon, how many were there? Um, so um, we were five in each breakout room. I could probably have made a fourth one, um, but that was how it was just, we was just as Pam came in, that was as it was. Um, no, it was a, a good session. Like the, the group, the room I talked about um, uh, was, there were some short stories sharing about um, how different teams operate, like if it's female dominated or male dominated um, and how, and how, especially with the with with the jungle analogy you brought, talked a bit about that. Like you, everyone can see self as, a, as the lion, and, and especially in a corporate work where it's like I want to race to the top, and I don't sh uh, spare anyone to get there, no matter who they are or what they are, or especially not 
women for some extent through some organization. And so that was one of the things we we talked about and and, and heard some experiences from, which was, uh, uh, yeah, it was it was um, it was great to hear about those. Um, I don't know uh, what room two had, which was with Arthur and Marion and Brad. Do one of you, Brad or Marion or Arthur, want to um, tell us? Marion, what about you? I'm, I'm, I'm playing army volunteers. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, I up the provocation. Um, I, I pose the question, is it that uh, the current systems, organization structures and things that we work in are actually zoos because they're so patriarchal? And that because we want to change things and we want to be more equitable and, and, and equal, we want it to be a jungle. And so there's a lot of strife and, and you know, holding on to those power, those grids and power lines because a zoo, in a zoo you can put 15 zebra on a small camp and two lion and a big camp and you can say, no, but the lion needs space. Um, Whereas in the jungle, there's much more uh, uh, chance for things, things to happen, to happen. organically. <laughs> right. Thank you. Fascinating. Really fascinating. Um, there's nothing like a good analogy to get people's imaginations firing. Um, with, was there another breakout room? There was one with uh, Amanda and Laurel and uh, Pam and Stu. Yes. Um, do one of you guys want to... Amanda. You're, you're unmuted. Oh, yes, I am unmuted, but I don't, we, we only just sort of started getting into the conversation a bit. So Stu probably had the, the most to say. <laughs> um, do you want to repeat what you, you said, Stu? It was more of a question than saying. I just, I just found myself wondering that we, these tactics might not work in the, in the, the zoos that we've created. Uh, but in saying that, is that true? Are, are, are the tactics not working? Or is that, are they, do we think they're not working because we're comparing them to the unhealthy, unbalanced, uh, all or nothing type outcomes that we expect from the male dominated environment? Or I, I like to say masculine dominated environment rather than male. I know plenty of guys that suffer at the hands of alpha males as well as, as, well as women. Uh, in terms of making a difference to the organisation. So what's our measure here of what is successful? And maybe those tactics above are actually the right way to go. And we just had a discussion today about uh, the changes that COVID's brought and how we're all a lot more relaxed and working from home and we're not so full on, which is a lot more like the tactics that were mentioned. So at our workplace, we've kind of moved more towards that and maybe that'll change how things are measured. Yeah, really good point. Really interesting point. Um, thank you. Um, was there another room? Um, uh, no, that was that was the room. That was it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. All all really really great points. And sort of let's um, have those sinking into our heads. I, I had a um, when I saw that jungle zoo analogy, it made me think of something. Um, actually, Laurel, I'm going to put you on the spot because. <laughs> We caught up the other day and I mentioned this quickly to you um, and uh, you're, you're uh, one of our complexity experts. So do you remember uh, what we were talking about in terms of the jungle versus zoo and, and um, in, in terms of complexity or have I put you on the spot? No, you put me on the spot. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. We had, we had a very involved conversation, yeah. That's remiss of me. Um, what I wondered, and I am happy for anybody in the room, in the, the Zoom session to slap me down, but again, this is another provocation to maybe get us thinking. Um, I take everybody's point on board and I'm interested in, in um, Stu's point. How do we know if they're actually succeeding or not? How are we measuring them? Um, but I, I was thinking maybe some of these tactics that we mentioned in our Zoom cascade, maybe they're not working or maybe they they seem to be working and then were very easily kind of rolled back last year for, for certain workplaces uh, because they they were suited um, or best suited to complicated situations 
as opposed to complex situations. Um, when I think about the reasons, all the reasons why women's talents are underutilized, um, unseen, hidden, unsurfaced, underdeveloped, for me, that's a, a, a massively complex and messy situation, messy uh, issue. And um, I can't be the only one who has seen certain tactics rolled out in an organisation and thought that's not going to work, that's totally <coughs> And it's not that the tactic itself is good or bad, but maybe it's not fit for purpose. Again, I don't have answers here, and I don't think we're going to get to them in uh, the next half an hour. But I'm putting that in there just so when we think about why women's talents are underutilised, we can think about it in terms of just how complex the situation is. Uh, and if we want to take action, whether we're mapping our actions against expectations around complicated situations or complex situations. Um, while you're in the breakout rooms, I've got a chance to have a, a read of the Zoom chat, which is wonderful and rich. Um, Margaret has recommended something I've got in the wakelet, Janice Fraser's uh, slide deck, Women in Leadership. It is excellent, and I recommend that you look it up. Sharon, thank you so much for that Guardian article that is going into the wakelet collection. It's like it's going to the pool room, in a sense. Um, but that, that highlights a very interesting problem where um, unconscious biases lead to a bad situation. Um, Imogen, I loved your mention that you, I think it was Imogen, that you worked in, the, in a lovely team where all of my peers were women and many of us were mums working part-time. We had great practices for sharing work. Um, Imogen, do you mind unpacking that? just a little bit for a couple of minutes? No, no, I don't mind. I talked about it a bit in my breakout room, so it might be boring for those people. Um, but we just had, yeah, practices about, because we were doing similar roles, we did manage particular people, but we had just shared inboxes and we made sure that whatever work came up that day, there was, you know, somebody was the admin person for that day, somebody else was on particular quality checks that day. Um, and we would just make it as seamless as possible. So for the people that we were dealing with, really didn't matter who was there. Nobody was saying, oh, is, is Imogen in today or is this her day off? And, oh, no, she's not here because the kid's sick. But, you know, just the work was done. Um, yeah, that, really good communication. That That's fantastic. And it's really lovely to hear um, a positive example of um, how, how things can be um, kind of configured. And I think other people have mentioned that it's not just good for women, it's good for everybody. So, you know, there, there are strengths um, there, quite obviously. Um, I'm just thinking about our next provocation, and I'm quite interested in this idea of things that are hidden, because uh, we can all point to very obvious markers of um, how, how women's talents might be underutilised, how women's careers might stall. We can point to statistics, quotes, uh, about pay gaps, about lack of women in leadership roles. And there's been quite a lot of studies about that. But there is other stuff that is, is hidden and bubbling beneath the surface. So I want to set up um, another provocation uh, about the things that may hold women back in getting their talents better utilised or, or recognised. Um, so uh, I'll, in a second, uh, I'll give you the nod, Simon, when I'm ready. Um, I'll send you back into a breakout room. Um, I'm going to uh, refer back to uh, that, that article that Sharon has mentioned in the, in the Zoom chat about the female problem and the male bias. So that, that unconscious um, bias, how do you spot that at work? It's, it's terribly, terribly hard to do. Um, so my provocation, and I think it's a tricky one, but how do you spot markers of, of bias that is hard to see? And how do you speak to them? How do you surface um, that, that unconscious bias when you think you see somebody at work? Again, in my, you know, crazy PowerPoint presentation that doesn't work, um, and there was a, a slide um, 
or maybe it's in the wakelet from memory, but somebody in Twitter had put up a, a mischievous slide saying, if you apply for a job and the only woman you encounter during the whole process is an administrator in the HR department, should you point that out? Um, but it was a good point that if you encounter these uh, figures of authority in the hiring, firing process and they're all male, um, what does that say about things? So the provocation is hidden or unconscious biases. How do you spot them? How do you call them out? And of course, five minutes will be absolutely ample to talk about that. So, Simon, can you? Uh, yeah, I have reshuffled the um, breakout room, so hopefully most people will see someone else they haven't seen before. Uh, nice work, this, thank you. Uh, I didn't assign you to anything, Meredith, but right. I'm going to jump into one. I might jump into this one.
Hi, Ken. How'd you go? You're, you're muted. muted. How'd you go? Good. Mm. I'm a bit of a, I, you know, I, I've, I've sort of, um, can, I'm thinking of a few counterpoints, but I do um, see a lot of value in, in, in thinking about these things. I think for a lot of women, um, this is what we bark our chins up against. You know, it's the it's the stuff that is is tends to be hidden or not easily kind of talked to or talked about. Um, you could quite frankly talk for hours about this stuff. So five minutes is not um, sufficient. I think Laurel was making a really good point, and then we got pointed out. <laughs> We also stopped halfway. We we feel very deprived. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's. I don't, um, I don't yeah, like this. Okay. I don't like this, Miss Andrew. It's evident tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling picked on. <laughs> yes, you're looking very disempowered there, Brad. So. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but this is an interesting thing. Is empowering one part of the of the equation necessarily disempowering the other part i shouldn't like if you are worth okay so this is a horrible way of putting it but if if this if if, if this thing i'm holding in this hand is worth one dollar and this one is worth 99 cents and now i make this one dollar too so these two are worth the same did i devalue this one no i didn't yeah I just made the choice between the two on a more equal footing because both are uh, worth a dollar. And now you can you can say either this one or this one. And it, you know, I, I find it fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, if, if somebody ends up being disempowered, then it's not true empowerment for the other party, actually. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I think if you share power, you can increase it. It should be increase um but yeah, it, it, i think that's true in a in an ideal world but okay. in the reality that we see you know as you mentioned before in canberra and in a lot of you know sort of male dominated hierarchical you know societies um some of those things do need to be disempowered uh according to the current and you know i'm sure laurel could talk at length about you know the blokey culture at Victoria Police and you know how it really needed to be disempowered, uh, and in the end she said you know what I don't have to put up with this bullshit and went elsewhere. That, that's absolutely true, Arthur. I, I think um, certain things are going to have to be given up for sure. But if you see it that when you give up those things uh, and disempower certain very particular issues, and I agree completely with what you're saying, you can you can do it in such a way that other things are gained other richnesses are gained. And I, I guess when I talk about sharing power, that doesn't mean to say that there's not going to be huge change in order to do that for people. And certain discrete things are going to have to be given up um, and abandoned. And there may even be grief. Why not? If it's a, if it's a big change of life. But um, I, I guess my thinking, and okay, I'm Pollyanna, but my thinking is that em empowerment for one, can mean empowerment for all if change is willingly undertaken and other things are gained. Um, I, I hear you. We're not in an ideal world and it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's, there's great truth in what you're saying, Meredith. And the, 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 issue, the issue becomes um, those with the power, those with the resources, those with the money um, have to play in a way to say, oh, well, it's fair. You know, but their mindset is yes. not of, of of that ilk, and it's all the subconscious biases, it's all the privilege, it's all the, you know, the 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 other stuff that they've had all their lives, and and this doesn't necessarily just be male female, right? Mm. It's 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 all sorts of things. It's it's race, it's uh, uh, various other privilege. You know, who gets what? So there's a huge mindset shift. I, I really like the mm. quote that Ricardo Samuel said. He was the author of uh, Maverick uh, from, I think, the 1990s. And he said, uh, um, if you have to give back, you've taken too much. Mm -hmm. so, you, know, mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got to 
balance the way that you interact uh, uh, as opposed to extract, extract, extract. Oh, perhaps I can give a little back. Isn't that nice of me? I'm a philanthropist. You know, it's like <laughs> it, 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 there's a big mindset. Yeah, I like what you're saying, Arthur. Can we kind of mentally bookmark that? Because I'm going to come back to what Arthur has just said because it ties in with my what is soon going to be my closing comments. So thanks for that. I do quickly want to go around the breakout rooms and find out where people got up to and if there are any other points that people want to surface. So Yeah, um, I can start here. Amanda, Arthur and Morgan had one. I don't know if that was what we came out of. Her. It was we were a bit late to our conversation. Um, um, if you have anything else to Amanda, if you have anything else to add? Me? Yeah, or like just what you talked about in the breakout room or if that was what captured by Arthur's. What Arthur well, said just then. Some of it was, yeah. 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 All right. All right, we can go on to the next one. Uh, Dick, Catherine, Laurel, and Brad. Mm -hmm. Somebody can tell the story I told. <laughs> I'd like to see your interpretation of it. <laughs> Catherine, you've unmuted. You're up. Um, fascinating, fascinating story was shared with regard to um, noticing an unconscious bias within a senior leadership team and raising it and, and being shot down the process. So actually having the confidence, and it was pretty appalling, mm. or, you know, bias to them, but to anyone in this day and age would be appalling. Um, yet, yet, yet it wasn't, it, it didn't change their direction. So it's one thing about you're talking about, you know, how do you share it? How do you spot it? How do you surface it? But then that's, that's all well and good and you've got the confidence to do it. But then if they shoot you down, then you get... Yeah, don't change direction, and then yeah, you get negative feedback from you on on, on your career path and give reprimands and stuff. So it was yeah. very fascinating. I, I think that's a really important point to make, and it kind of goes back to what Arthur and Amanda and have so far touched on as well. That there is people who have power do not want to give it up. They don't have a reason to, and they have they figure they have too much to lose. They're not enlightened like us. Mm -hmm. um, but there's huge risk in trying to surface this stuff, huge risk. Um, speaking as somebody who's stuck their neck out a few too many times. So I, I think it's it's a really important point to make. Um, yeah, just conscious uh, of time, is there another we, breakout room? Yeah, there are two more, so Ken, Pam and Sharon. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken, Pam and Sharon, just one of, Sharon, you're unmuted. How about you? Give us a pricey, what you talked about. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I went through an example where um, I was a female sitting near a, a door and people, all the people came in off the foyer, made the assumption that I must be the receptionist or the secretary. Um, and I just had wondered whether that same thing would happen if it had been a male sitting at that desk. Um, and then the other point was made, of course, that there's not just the gender bias, there's a whole range of biases that can come into play around, um, you know, whether you're kind of white versus Asian or something else, whether you, how do you speak? Do you kind of use language the same way? Do you kind of say TH as an F? Um, a whole range of things. And I guess unfortunately Ken dropped out but Pam and I were then saying you know you can all even have the situation where someone is just a quiet personality versus mm -hmm. a really dominant one and and even if they've said something it's not heard because it's oh that's Fred in the corner yeah don't worry about him whereas the big loud person um, and then Pam also gave examples where she had said something in a meeting it was as if she was not heard at all and the male sitting next to her repeated exactly the same thing. And then people went, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And you think, well, hang on, did they not hear me? So yeah. there can be a range of those. Those things. Yeah, good oh. points. And I've certainly seen all of that at play. And I think many people have. I've heard um, stories from so many people I know, um, male and female, actually. So again, bookmarking that idea around intersectionality, which I think Arthur raised as well. Um, the last 
breakout yeah, room. I'll, I'll do it quick. So I raised a bit of personal story um, from my partner about uh, negotiating pay and how women are often, I know from a few of my female friends or women, uh, they're not the best at negotiating and they often feel like it's it's a big ask to ask for a raise or negotiating if you come into a new group. And that they thought to Margaret, a, a, talking a bit about like more um, biases, unconscious biases, um, I just lost the thread um, about uh, how, I don't know if anyone can jump in, Mar Margaret or Stu, just quickly. One of the biases that came up was um, from Marianne's experience, actually, of being the primary breadwinner. And we were talking about how maybe that can be a negotiation tool because a lot of, a lot of people who are in senior management assume that the primary breadwinner needs to keep their job. Whereas they may not assume that a woman needs to keep her job, not realizing that you know women do most of the caregiving in a family. <laughs> nice point. That it's a, a, a continuing role; it doesn't leave you. Um, my sister is still looking after her forty-four-year-old son, who has mental health issues. Um, so her financial stability has an effect on his health. That, that, that's a consider that um, in the context of asking for a raise. It's a really powerful negotiating tool. Shutting up now. Yeah, no, that's a, sorry, I've buzzed in a couple of times. That's a really great point to make. Actually, nice tactic to say, yes, I am a bread winner. It, it is important that I earn money. Um, it, it, this reminds me again on my defunct PowerPoint. I, I had, I think, a slide where I found, again, on Twitter, a really good Twitter discussion where uh, a man offered some really great advice to women and said, do you realise that when I hire women, they underquote themselves and men who do the same quality of work uh, put in much larger quotes. So ladies, up your quotes, please. Uh, it was great advice and it was taken as great advice from women who replied. Um, but a lot of them did make the point that when women ask for higher rates for their work, they risk not getting hired. They're often not hired. So there's still that bias in play. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, I also um, found, and I've got a note here on my, um, int, um, on my website, um, there was a, an article in HBR uh, that outlined some analysis of feedback that was given to leaders, and it found that um, men are encouraged to be ambitious, leverage politics and show confidence. Uh, women are advised to get along, cope with politics, feel confident. And I just thought I'd offer that as a small example of, uh, again, some of those more buried biases that are, are hard to see. Because I bet the people giving that feedback, and they may be female as well as male, I bet they don't even know they're doing it. So this stuff is tricky. And it's feels unresolvable. And um, I'm just about to release the conversation from my constraints. My time as facilitator is nearly up. But as with all these things, we've steered ourselves to a really juicy part in the conversation. So you're welcome to hang around and just keep on chatting after I finish at 7.30. We're going to keep the Zoom open for a bit longer. But the reason why I wanted to surface this particular conversation um, is it goes right back to what we were doing at the beginning in that Zoom cascade, when we cascaded all those little tactics. And I was saying, why don't they always work? Why haven't they had more effect? And the problem is that even, so, even though some of those tactics might be great, they're being deployed against this kind of background, this kind of complexity, um, these big questions that are being surfaced by people. So, I'm gonna leave you with that thought. I'm gonna ask you to consider your personal agency when you go out there into the big bad world, back into your jungles or zoos, what are you empowered to do? And whatever it is, um, just bear in mind that you're dealing with that complexity. And if you're dealing with women in your life or indeed maybe men who you consider to be uh, disenfranchised in some way or disadvantaged, bear this in mind um i did also want to touch sorry I, I just did want to very briefly touch on something that a couple of you raised 
Um, and you pointed out quite rightly that this is not just always about sexism, it can be about um, issues to do around class, uh, race, um, personality types. As an introvert, I spot that one. It can also be around um, gender identity or sexual orientation. So when you get intersectional, there's no way, shape or form we had time to get into that stuff tonight. But I thought it would be really remiss of me not to at least mention it. And I'm really glad other people surfaced it because uh, I know from conversations with those people um, that when they encounter that kind of bias, it, it doesn't just uh, add to sexism or whatever else they've got going on in their lives. It compounds it so that the biases they have to deal with take on their own particular flavour. Um, but that's, a, that's an issue for a whole other conversation. But I, I really felt it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that. Um, I'm just about finished. Um, this was kind of a cook's tour of the complexities of uh, why women, female talent is underutilized or, or underdeveloped, unrecognized, underpaid, whatever. Um, it feels kind of almost silly to try and tackle something so complex in just an hour. Um, and I've been haunted, like I said, during these weeks about what I would have to leave out. But thank you so much for offering what you have, because as always with KMLF, it has been very, very rich. Um, I will take um, all... Yes. Just Stu had his, raised his hand earlier. I don't know if you want to have a quick comment. Uh, I, I just wanted to say thanks for mentioning the complexity of it. Um, it's, it's not always bad intentions and hurtful things that are, that are causing this. Uh, and it's not always ignorance either. Um, I, I'm dealing with a situation at work right now where I'm fighting for a lady under me to get a pay rise to be paid properly for the work she's doing. Uh, I'm very aware that that pay rise will come from a fixed pool and will rob the opportunity of two other guys who are also underpaid for their work from getting a pay rise. But they're not my responsibility, she is. I'm aware that she's got a house three times the worth of mine. She's not a primary breadwinner. And it's been really, really difficult for me to fight for her to get what she's worth knowing I'm stealing from these two other guys who are primary breadwinners. It's been really a really difficult moral thing for me to do. And I, I feel like I'm the bad guy, but it's great that you acknowledge that it's complex. There's a lot going on. Um, thank you, Stu. That's really interesting. And of course, you know, these fascinating comments surface now, you know, when I'm about to sign off. Mm. But um, I really like your, your opening words and I think we should all cling on to them because it's not about always about people being bad or ill-intentioned or malicious or even ignorant. Um, the complexity is an important thing to hold in your mind. Um, if thank you. Very... And I, I might sign off and I hand back to you, Simon. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for facilitating and steer us through this conversation and as Stu and yourself touch on it is a very complex and it is even our own biases we are uh, I'm sure all of us have been guilty of it in the past um, of having an unconscious bias against women or against ourselves in some way or another um, and it's something we need to be aware of all of us. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Amanda uh, just to